Hey everybody, thanks for coming and checking out this sweet, sweet video of mine. Um, so my name is Thomas Hunter. I'm producing this video as a part of a sort of a series on game development videos. Um, so if you're interested in this cons this uh, this content, check out my uh, Patreon at patreon.com slash tlhunter. And of course, here we have a screenshot of this uh, said Patreon page. Uh, and so today's topic, I'm going to cover the topic of... Um, uh, creating a bitmap font uh, in particular uh, for use with phaser and now creating creating this font is um, is probably something that's actually useful with uh, other engines or other rendering uh, tools other than phaser um, however I'm specifically specifically going to show how to use it with phaser uh, and so uh, the approach we're going to take is we're going to hunt down a uh, TTF font uh, true type true type font. Of course, this is the most common uh, type of font that you're going to encounter in the wild. And so uh, we're going to download a, uh, a bitmap friendly TTF font uh, for use um, with conversion to a, uh, a bitmap font in a format that can be used uh, by Phaser. Cool. Um, so let's see. Yeah, I suppose step one, we can uh, look for a font. So my favorite website to find fonts is dafont.com. Uh, I've been using it for, I think, about 10 years. Uh, it's pretty useful. It has a lot of fonts with different uh, licenses and etc. Uh, some fonts cost money. Uh, some are free. Some have weird clauses like you need to send a CD-ROM or like an email or a postcard to you know somebody in the Netherlands who made the font. Um, but at any rate, when you do pick a font, make sure that you check the license and uh, make sure that it's compatible with whatever use uh, you're planning on using it for. So me personally, of course, I'm uh, working on this game called Crossover. It's a, a, a mobile game based on web technology. Uh, and so I need to be able to make sure that a font that I grab um, has the has the right license for me. So, you know, I would need um, a font that allows me to uh, redistribute it, um, you know, while encapsulated in a program, but without the ability for uh, those who I distribute it to to be able to uh, extract and modify the font. All right, and so, of course, um, the game I'm working on is a bitmap game, and I'm kind of going to assume that you are also working on a, uh, sorry, the game I'm working on is a retro game, so I'm going to assume that you're also perhaps working on a retro game. And so, of course, with retro games, you want, you know, nice bitmap fonts with harsh edges. Uh, you know, we don't want anti-aliasing. Uh, basically, we want the font to be uh, on or off. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down here to the bitmap, sub bitmap section. So we have uh, this pixel bitmap link right here. So once we click that, we'll see a whole bunch of different fonts. So, you know, the sky is yours. There's there's many options here. A lot of these are extracted from, um, you know, existing games or old arcade cabinets. Um, I think there's probably about three of them. Yep. So there's a bunch on here that are, like, you know, based on the Minecraft game. And, of course, you wouldn't be able to use this this Minecraft font within a title you're uh, working on. It's it's probably safe to assume that the Minecraft font is, you know, copy written. Uh, by a large company, so we might not want to use that. Um, pixelated though, this one seems kind of neat. So it's, it's got these nice crisp edges, it supports uh, uppercase and lowercase. Because um, I'm not really digging these lowercase characters, so maybe we move on. Minecrafty uh, Press Start 2P, this one seems fun. So we're going to check it out. So when you uh, actually view font on the website, you can actually type in punctuation as well. Um, so, actually, here's one I already typed previously. So I can submit this, and then we can see if the um, if the text renders and what symbols we get. So the thing is, a lot of these fonts they don't actually support every uh, symbol. The last font I was working on um, didn't support commas, for example. And so I'd written all this content, and my commas were disappearing. It was uh, it was kind of kind of frustrating. Um, so whatever font you pick, you want to make sure um, that it supports uh, every ligature uh, that your your use case requires. Um, so, just for the sake of this demo, though, I'm going to skip uh, looking at the license. You would want to, um, however, peruse it for whatever font you're choosing. Um, however, I think since I'm just making this video, it's it's going to fall under fair use. All right, so I've downloaded this font, and here we see the contents. Oh, one thing worth worth uh, mentioning is that I'm doing all this uh, work on a Linux machine. However, it will be uh, pretty similar to uh, the same workflow on um, Linux and uh, Mac as well. Um, there'll be a few caveats. So for example, here we're going to look at the first caveat. 
and that is uh, when it comes to font uh, installation. And so for example, um, on Linux, when I want to install a font, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a directory in my, um, in my uh, user directory called fonts. So in this case, it's home slash tlhunter slash fonts. And so within this directory, I can actually put in these true type fonts, and they'll then be available to my system. So of course, that's going to change on like uh, Mac or uh, Windows. So on Mac and Windows, I think it's as easy as double clicking uh, the true type font once you um, extract it. And then I believe the dialog which appears will give you an installation option. However, in Linux, I'm simply going to extract this, this file here. Cool. Now I'm done. Here, I can double click it. Um, and here we can see the, con the, the, uh, the content of the font at different sizes. Cool. And of course, again, you'd want to read this license. Actually, let's just take a quick peek. Uh, quick peek. Definitions, blah, 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 permissions, not the defined components, version modified. Mm -mm -mm. Ah, too much to read. Um, again, yeah, just read through the license, read all the content, make sure you're not breaking any laws when you actually use it in your application. Cool, so now I've got this font uh, extracted and um, it is now available to my system. Um, now that we've done that, we actually want to run a different tool. And so, so here's a really useful tool. If you do a Google search for BM font, uh, the first thing that should come up will be this angelcode.com entry. Um, so the, the URL for this is angelcode.com slash products slash BM font. So this tool right here, this is the bitmap font generator. It's a pretty old Windows application and it's used for um, creating these bitmap fonts. And so I believe um, this angel this angel code uh, entity created this sort of bitmap font um, format, which I believe is then used by, um, it sort of became a standard and used by other tools. So what you'd want to do is download one of these versions. There's, um, let's see, version uh, 1.13 is from 2012, which is, you know, of course, forever ago, but then there's 1.14 beta is from uh, several months ago. Personally, I'm using 1.13, and it seems to be working fine. Uh, and so you'll want to download this application, and you'll want to install it. Uh, this application is actually a Windows application. So you're probably wondering, Tom, you know, how are you going to run this, this Windows application on your computer? Uh, well, the thing is, you can actually, once you download the, uh, the executable file, if you have Wine installed, whoops, ran the wrong program. If you have Wine installed, um, you can it'll actually go through the installer and it'll install it for you on Linux. All right, and so this is what the application looks like uh, once you run it. And so this is actually showing entries from a, a previous conversion I was doing with a with a different font. And so this this application is actually really really confusing to work with. Um, Actually, honestly, between you and me, don't tell anybody. Uh, one of the reasons I'm recording this video is so that in the future, when I have to do this process again, I can actually just watch this video and figure out how it's done. Uh, so this is this will be my, I think, fifth time uh, doing this whole conversion process uh, for for the various games I've worked on. And so it's it's unfortunately it's a little bit painful, but as far as I know, this is the best free tool for doing this uh, font conversion. Uh, if you do know of a better tool, please let me know, um, either on my Patreon at TLHunter or at my Twitter, again, TLHunter. Uh, you know, send me a message and uh, let me know of a better tool. That would be awesome. So uh, once, you, once you launch this, by default, it's going to show a different font. I think it, it defaults to uh, Arial. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to option, uh, Options and then go to uh, Font Settings. So in here, uh, this is where we actually get to select the font. The, the second option here lets you select a TTF font from disk, like in any arbitrary folder. However, as far as I can tell, it's actually broken. It, selecting a font in here does absolutely nothing. Uh, but perhaps you'll have better luck than I do. However, in this drop-down here, the first drop-down, where you, where you uh, the one entitled font, this is where you'll actually want to find the font. Uh, and so the font we downloaded is called Press Start 2P. So it should be down in the P's. Uh, press start 2p. There it is. Cool. Um, so let's see. We might actually have to go back and forth a little bit to get these settings right. So currently I have uh, the character set is set to Unicode. The size is set to 8 pix. Uh, so I believe the, the size here 
doesn't really affect the output. However, the size here needs to resemble uh, the size that you specify in your application. So here we have a, the size set to 8 pix. Um, so within your application, you'll need to load the font as 8 pixels. Uh, if the font is different, then you get um, you know, some ugly stretching. Let's see, so we have Mac, uh, match character height selected. Uh, we have render from true type outline selected. True type hinting is off. Hinting is used for, um, I believe, for, uh, for highlighting partial pixels. And since we're dealing with the bitmap font, I don't think that option is required. Font smoothing, again, that, that'll like smooth the edges. But since we're dealing with the bitmap font, you don't want to select it. Super sampling, I guess that means they, they probably read the font multiple times to ensure that it's, it's grabbing the exact perfect version. Uh, I'm not really sure, but I leave that empty, and I leave outline thickness uh, empty as well. Now, if you do choose to use a bitmap font with a, uh, with a non-pixelated font, uh, you, you will probably want to change these settings. All right, so now I'm going to hit OK. All right, so the font we were looking at previously has now disappeared, and we're now looking at uh, the, the ready two-player font. And now, so on the right, this shows the different collections of, I believe, uh, Unicode characters. So for example, I click Latin Extended A, so we're seeing a bunch of uh, you know, accent marks and whatnot on the characters. Latin Extended B, uh, we see an interesting F. Uh, spacing modifier, uh, Greek, Cyrillic. Um, so we can see a bunch of stuff in here. Um, let's see, anything else? Do they have, just curious, do they have Japanese? Doesn't look like it. All right. So, so these are all the, the possible ligatures supported in this font. However, for the, for the case of, um, for our situation, we're only going to work with uh, English characters for now. And so by default, if the, um, let's see, by default, it only selects um, half of the Latin characters. And so if each one of these boxes, um, yeah, let's, okay, let's look at each boxes. So these first two rows of boxes here, we see that they have, um, it's like gray with gray slashes, like a gray lattice pattern. So that means um, this font doesn't support those symbols uh, whatsoever. And so since this is, I believe these probably correlate to like their ASCII positions, which means there's probably like control sequence characters in here, you know, things that we don't actually need to print, is my assumption. Um, since the since the, the lower Unicode characters map to ASCII. Anyway, so it's not really into the interesting stuff, you know, in the middle uh, that we actually have the characters uh, available to us. So in this case, we see that, you know, we get a bunch of punctuations, numbers, letters, uppercase, lowercase. And so this is probably what we want. If we did want more characters, you can go through and click them to toggle them. Um, however, we're just going to keep these unselected. Cool, so once you've gone through and you've selected all the characters you need for your game, you know, perhaps you're targeting you know, a Greek uh, audience as well or whatever. Uh, at any point, once you've selected all your fonts, it's now time to get ready to export. So now we want to go into Options, then Export Options. And so in here, there's a bunch of different settings that we have as well. Um, let's see. So normally what I do is I leave padding all at zero, spacing at one. Um, Let's see, equalize cell heights, keep that empty. And um, so this actually does some cool stuff, the way the font is packaged uh, later on. And we'll, we'll take a peek at the outputted files just so you kind of know what's going on. Um, but I believe for the most part, the, the default settings are good. Um, for the texture file here, you can adjust it if you need uh, later on. But we'll take a peek to see if we need it or not. Um, since we're dealing with a simple number, of, like a low number of colors, I think we can leave the bit depth low. So I think by default, what you want to do is you want to try a width and height of 64. Uh, this tool might actually default to 256 by 256. I don't remember. Um, but really, it'll depend on how big your fonts are. And so since we're dealing with these pixel fonts, you know, they're pretty small. And you know, each one of these fonts here is probably like, you know, 8 by 8 pixels or something. So yeah, actually, this font might be too big uh, for 64 by 64. Uh, but whatever, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Let's see. And then down here in the channels for the alpha, you can do red, green, blue. Let's see, so for the alpha channel, I use, I believe, glyph. Uh, don't select invert. And then, let's see down here, presets. I believe this will change the above values. And I think these values correlate to white text with alpha. Actually, let's take a, let's just click it and see what happens. Yep, so glyph and then no inverted. But if you were to select these other options, I think it, yeah, it, it kind of changes the settings above. Cool. 
And now, uh, now it's time to actually change the important stuff. So down here in file format, I believe by default it selects text, but what you'll want to do is select XML. And then for the textures, uh, make sure that you're using a PNG texture. And the compression should only have the one option of deflate. So once we've got these settings set, uh, you can go ahead and click OK. Now it's actually time to save the font. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do options. Um, let's see, save bitmap font as. And so now it's going to ask us where we actually want to save the font. And so I'm going to go in here. I have my phaser font example. And then so what you want to do is you'll actually want to save this font somewhere in your um, in your uh, your application code. Like for example, if you're making a mobile game, you know you'd save it somewhere in a publicly accessible um, area. So what I like to do is I like to have like a, a folder called fonts, which will sit next to my images and scripts and CSS folders, uh, etc. So I'm just going to go to fonts, and I'm going to go ahead and name this font. So the name of this font that we're working with is uh, Press Start 2P. So I'm just going to call it Press hyphen start hyphen 2p and I'm going to go ahead and save it. Now that that's done it's time to cross our fingers and see what we've generated. Um, so I'm going to go back to our game folder go into fonts. Alright and so what 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 we've got here now is um, in this case we have three different files. Um, so the first one is the XML file which describes the font and then the other ones are the actual images. And so, as you can see here, we actually have two images. So that means that when we selected the 64 by 64, it actually wasn't big enough. And then so it spilled into these two, uh, two separate images. And so I haven't tried using multi-image fonts with Phaser yet. Um, you know, it might work, but really I just prefer to have a single image for the font. So let's go ahead and open one of these and see what it looks like. Okay, awesome. You can't really, you might not be able to tell on video. I'm going to try to zoom in. It'll be a little fuzzy due to this image viewer I'm working with. Um, but it is actually um, working with pixel perfect uh, images here. So when I go back to the 1x zoom, when I put my face next to the screen, I can confirm that this is actually pixel by pixel. And so that's cool. What that means is that um, the settings we got were actually correct. And, um, you know, we didn't screw anything up and we're not stretching stuff. However, again, we're, we're dealing with two images and we don't really like that. So one thing to mention here is that if you were to actually look, you know, really close on the images, Notice how, for example, this L here, um, like the bottom of the L is lower than the other characters. Or, you know, this lowercase g starts in the upper right corner. Or if we go to the second image, this is where we'll see more interesting stuff. See how, for example, like the heights um, don't really, um, they're not all even. And so actually this font doesn't show it as well. I've seen other fonts that do a better job. Um, but for but what this, what this tool does is it takes every single character in your font and it starts um, sticking them all together in an attempt to use the least amount of space possible. However, it's not doing something... So for example, here we have a period. Uh, this is a 2 by 2 pixel block. That block could have, for example, fit inside the C or the R. Um, however, that wouldn't have worked because um, the way this bitmap font works is that it actually grabs, for example, the square around the C and so it'll grab, or not really a square, but a rectangle. So what we'll do is we'll copy this rectangle around a shape, uh, and then we'll copy it into our game somewhere, like into our canvas. Uh, and so that's really how, how Canvas works with images. You have source images, and you have destinations, and you can, uh, when you read from the source, you specify an X and a Y offset, and you also specify a width and a height. And then your destination, you also specify an X and a Y destination. It will copy an image uh, from the source to the destination. And so that's, how, that's why these bitmap fonts are actually pretty quick. So instead of using like a, a normal TTF font where you got to like calculate, um, you know, all the edges and the hinting and the anti-aliasing, and it takes a whole bunch of work to go ahead and draw that. Instead, we're just copying this, uh, this bitmap data, this, uh, this bitmap data from these PNG images, and it ends up being really fast. All right, so again, yep, we have to go back into this tool. I'm going to tweak the options slightly. So I'm going to go into Export Options. The thing with these textures is that you do want to use Powers of 2. And so that's, um, that's so that when the textures are loaded into the GPU um, of the device, whether it be a desktop or a mobile game, you know, you want them to, um, they need to fit in Powers of 2 uh, so that they, um, Honestly, I don't know entirely why. It's I think the way the GPU stores all the textures is they just have to store everything in Powers of 2. So the thing is, if I were to use an arbitrary number like 100 by 100, um, I believe 
Um, I think the browser will just do the right thing and internally it'll stretch it up to 128 by 128 and then you'll have 28 pixels of, of empty space on the right and the bottom. But anyway, I like to just set them to powers of 2 um, just so that it's, I, I suppose, uh, more correct. Alright, so I've changed this texture, hit OK. I'm going to I'm going to go back to this folder and delete the font we have so far because it's it's now incorrect. And so that is to say I've deleted that FNT uh, file and then the two PNGs. So now we're going to go back to this tool. Uh, we're going to do uh, save bitmap font as in the same fonts folder. I'm going to type in the name again. Um, press start uh, 2p. I'm going to hit save. Cool. This time we only have a single image. Uh, unfortunately, we're not using the full um, content of the image. So this is kind of inefficient. You know, of course, we're we're wasting most of this image. So actually, now that I think about it, the powers of two thing, um, they don't need to be equal. And so if we go to export options, I can actually change the height to be 64. And that would hold it, of course, because earlier we had two 64 by 64 images. Uh, if you add them together, if you put them side by side, that would be 128 by 64. So of course, when we export as 128 by 64, um, it would it'll hold all the content. So I'm going to save the font again. This time, actually, I'm not going to bother deleting it. I'm just going to save over what we already have. Keep in mind, if you do save over what you already have, and you go from having two images to two uh, font images to one. Um, you will still have uh, a spare font image that you don't need. And you could just uh, go ahead and delete it. All right, so cool. We're, uh, I double click this file. We see that everything fits. Uh, and so this is every single character. We can see all the characters that we need. And again, they won't necessarily be in the right order. Um, and they're all packaged together pretty nicely. Now there is a problem with this font, of course. Um, here we see that it's, it's white on black. You know, perhaps we want black on white. Or in my case, um, I deal with... Uh, in the crossover game I'm working on, I have a, a very specific palette of about 20 colors, and so I want to make sure that all the fonts are the right colors. So when you go ahead and draw these bitmap fonts inside a phaser, you can't dynamically change the font color uh, like you would with a word processor. You can sort of adjust the tint, but it's, it's not entirely accurate. Um, and I think there's some CPU overhead as well. And so for the most part, what you want to do is sort of pick a single color and then use that everywhere. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this in an image editor. Uh, I'm using Linux, and so I'm going to use the GIMP tool. Um, however, if you're on Windows, uh, you might, you know, like, perhaps you're using paint.net, or actually you can use GIMP on Windows, um, and perhaps maybe you've even purchased um, Photoshop. All right, so what I want to do is actually I want to have, um, I want the foreground to be a cream color, and I want the background to be transparent. Uh, so this first layer is actually an 8-bit PNG, and I think by default it doesn't support alpha transparency. So I can show that if I were to take an eraser and I were to erase some of this, I get a gray color instead of transparent. So what I'm going to do is, and this is a trick you can actually do in Photoshop 2, uh, I think. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but you can duplicate the layer. You can take the old layer, you can delete it, and then the new layer might have a new palette. So in this case, I have a tool which uh, selects select by color, and then what you can do is set the threshold to zero. You can um, ooh, you want to disable anti-aliasing. Uh, that way you're selecting every pixel, because like sometimes with these tools, especially with Photoshop, you can sort of uh, select half a pixel in a weird way. And so if you delete um, uh, if you delete the contents of the pixel, you actually only delete half the transparency. So yeah, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the the black area. And I can see it's now selected, and I'm going to hit delete, and I've now, whoops. So notice how it's still gray. It's not, um, it's not transparent, even though I did that trick where I duplicated the layer. So what that means is the color palette is wrong. Um, and so what I need to do, let's see if I can find it. Um, you'd think it would be in colors because we're changing colors. Components, map, info. Maybe not. Let's see. Edit. Preferences changes the program. Um, let's see. View. Image. It's funny. I've never had this problem before. Maybe if I select just the white text, copy it. If I do new layer, transparency is selected. Okay, there we go. So now we see that the um, this new layer is transparent. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to paste that selection that I made. And I'm going to anchor 
Gimp does this interesting thing with floating layers, and so if you click anchor, it'll anchor it down to uh, the layer below it. And so now I can go ahead and delete this background layer. There we go, and now we see the transparent background. So next thing I want to do is I actually want to change this foreground color. Instead of being pure white, I want to make it this cream color. So I'm going to select the cream color. I'm going to select the fill tool. And I've already selected um, all the foreground white pixels. So I'm going to use the bucket tool, and I'm going to paste it. And actually, um, so that color is wrong due to the, uh, the palette issue that I mentioned before. So I think really what you'd want to do is inside the bitmap font generator tool, instead of choosing the 8-bit, you'd probably want to instead choose the, um, uh, I think it was 16-bit or 32-bit option. Let's see, where are the colors? Sometimes colors. Ah, whatever. I'm going to cheat. I'm just going to do, make a new image. It's going to, I'm going to make it 128 by 64 pixels. By default, it should, ooh, the color space is wrong. So it's saying grayscale. Perhaps I've misconfigured my application and it's not the PNG image. So I'm gonna select RGB color, 128 by 64, default to transparent. I'm gonna paste that font in here. Um, unfortunately, the, it's shifted. It, uh, it needs to be at the top of the screen. So I'm gonna move that up. Uh, I'm gonna go back here for reference. We see a pixel empty on the right, and then we see the font touches the top and the left. So everything here is now lined up properly. So now I'm going to select just the white again. Oh, I need to anchor this layer. So I'm going to select the white text again. I'm going to select my cream color, the paint bucket option. I'm going to fill it in. Actually, is that color right? Yeah, that is. That color is correct. Cool. Um, yep, I can see a slight difference. So I can close the old image. So this new image, what I'm going to do is now I'm going to uh, export it. And so, uh, let's see, projects, crossover, nope, that's not the project I'm working on. Uh, we are working on the phaser font example. So I'm going to go to fonts. So here's the image from before. Um, notice how it's black and white, 915 bytes. I'm going to go ahead and export that. Yep, everything looks good. I'm going to come back to my font folder and sort of font's a little bigger because the, the palette's a little um, a little bigger as well. Cool, and so now we're, we're done with image editing. We're Actually, we're also done with the bitmap font generator tool. So unfortunately, we can't just use uh, these files as they sit here. We need to change them a little bit. Uh, the first thing I like to do is um, this tool you know, supports um, multiple images. And so uh, the way it works is it appends these numbers by default. However, since we're only going to work with a single image, I like to delete the um, suffix, the numeric suffix from the file. Another thing we need to do is this font file, we probably want to rename it to an XML file. Since the file is an XML, um, I think you know it, it, the MIME type as the file is served from your server probably also needs to be you know, XML as well. And so just renaming it to an XML makes it, makes it a lot easier to work with. Cool. So here I am editing the file. Um, you know, on Windows, you could perhaps open it with Notepad or Notepad Plus Plus or um, Atom Editor. You know, whatever the cool kids are using these days. So in here we see this is the content of the XML file. And so earlier I mentioned that the way um, uh, Phaser in Canvas in general works is that you copy uh, source image information to the destination uh, image. And so in this case, we have each one of these lines here represents a different character. So 32, for example, perhaps this represents an exclamation mark. And so what it's saying is that the X position of the exclamation mark starts at 126. The Y is 0, so it's going to be at the, the, uh, uh, the top of the image, but somewhere to the right. Uh, it's a single pixel wide, which makes sense it's, if it's an exclamation mark. Uh, the height is 1. Actually, this probably isn't an exclamation mark. Perhaps this is a period or something like that. Um, X offset, Y offset. Uh, I think that has to do with the padding values. X advanced page, page. That's if it's on a, you know, image zero, image one, uh, etc. So yeah, there's a bunch of information in here, and each one of these correlates to uh, each character um, that we want to copy. So one thing that we did is since we modified the image, we probably want to change the file name right here. And so that's in the fonts pages page uh, entry. So you want the, the file attribute to be properly named after the file. 
But the thing that really needs to change is that up in here, the size, for some reason, uh, at least on my computer and any time I've run this, the size ends up being negative. So what I want to do is I want to hit delete. I want to delete that minus symbol and then make it a po positive value. And then I'm going to go ahead and save it. And I think that's all the changes we need to make for now. Uh, but we can come back to that. All right, let's see. Where are we at? All right, I think we're doing pretty good. And so now that we have this font, what we want to do is we want to actually load it in our game. And so here, here I have uh, two editors running. So I'm going to make this a little smaller. That's, I guess that's kind of okay. So what I have on the right here is um, just an index HTML file. Um, and then so this has a whole bunch of boilerplate. Actually, you might like to pause the video and maybe copy some of the stuff out. Uh, it's pretty pretty good content. What this does is it ensures that the um, um, that your your HTML document is loaded um, with like font aliasing disabled, or sorry, anti aliasing disabled, um, like the the tap to select stuff, um, the phone number clicking, which can kind of slow down complex DOM rendering. Um, really, it just shuts off a lot of the browser features and makes it more um, more friendly for mobile game development. But the important field, the important stuff is down here. So what we have is we have a uh, element which holds the game field. Um, that will pass off to uh, Phaser, and it will be used for um, putting the canvas inside of. Uh, we also have, of course, we load the Phaser game engine. In this case, I've saved it locally. I suggest packaging uh, Phaser up inside your application, actually checking it into your Git repo and uh, making sure it all deploys together. Uh, that way, if you ever try to go back in time and you want to use an exact specific version of Phaser, you don't have to hunt through content delivery networks and stuff. It, uh, it really makes it easier to go back and run old games. And of course, we also want to load um, a script file of our own. Cool. Now over here, this is the actual content of the, the, the game engine. Um, and so this represents a really simple game, of course, um, you know, only being like 32 lines. Uh, that crossover game I'm working on, I think, I think currently it's at about 5,000 lines of JavaScript code. Uh, and so 32 is, is quite a bit simpler. Uh, Phaser has, I think, maybe nine scenes total. Uh, but for this, this demo that we're working on right now, uh, we only have a single scene. Um, cool. All right, so what we're doing is we're grabbing this element from the DOM, that game field. Um, here we have a scene. I'm just calling it init. So init will have two methods. The first one is called preload. And this is where we can perhaps configure uh, some information about our game, as well as load the assets that we need. Uh, we also have a create method. A create method. And once the scene is created, uh, this code is executed once. And it um, adds the appropriate um, sprites or text or whatever to the to the game field. Uh, down here, we actually initialize the game, so I'm hard coding it to be a width and height of 600. Uh, what I do in crossover is um, I actually do some interesting stuff where I um, calculate the width of the game that I want to support. Like for example, I only want to show uh, maybe I only want to show 10 tiles on the screen, and if it's tile is 16 pixels wide, that means I want the whole screen to be 160 pixels wide. And then I do some division with the actual viewport and then calculate the width and height. Um, it's actually, it can be a bit more involved. Um, but in this case, we're simply uh, using this hard-coded value of 800 by 600. Uh, the renderer is going to be, I'm going to render this in WebGL. You can also use uh, Canvas. I believe it's phaser.canvas uh, if you only want to do 2D rendering. Uh, and that really just changes the way uh, the back end of the game is rendered. It doesn't actually change anything uh, visually with the game. Uh, we also have anti-alias. I'm setting that to false. I don't want to do any aliasing um, anywhere in the whole game. You know, everything we want to be crisp because we're dealing with a pixel game, uh, a retro pixel art game. And then finally, the parent, that points to our DOM element, uh, which we specified at the top. Um, once that's done, you can do game state add. You can name your game state. In this case, we name it init, and it points to that init scene. Uh, and then we start the init scene. Um, but now, actually, inside of this init scene, we actually want to change uh, some of these values. Um, so specifically, the name of our font is, uh, oh, what is it? Ready, oh, press start 2p. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change all these values. 
So anytime I see this capital font, I'm gonna change it to be uh, press start uh, to P. So I'm gonna go back here, I'm gonna just change the formatting a little um, so that it's easier to read. Cool, so the first argument, um, sorry, let me step back. So what we're doing is we're taking the game object, which represents our uh, our phaser instance. Actually, this should. That's fine. So we're going to take this game object. Um, we're going to take the stage property. Sorry, we're going to come down here. Uh, so we take the game object. We perform a load, um, and then we're going to call this method called bitmap font, and it accepts three arguments. So the first will be the the name of the font. Actually, this could be really anything you want. So you know, maybe if you wanted to just name it main, you could call it that. Uh, so this this will be how we reference the font throughout the game. And so later in the game, when we actually add the bitmap text, is we'll refer to it as, as the, the actual name of the font, in this case, main. Uh, the second argument is the path to the PNG uh, file. And then the third, third argument is the path to the XML file. Whoops, I have too many quotes. Uh, cool, and so since we had renamed the PNG, we had renamed the XML, uh, that .fnt file XML, uh, this information is now correct. Um, cool. And so now, actually, within the um, the create method, we then call game.add.bitmapText. The first argument is the x coordinate. Uh, the second argument is the y coordinate. The third is the name of the font. Uh, the fourth, as you can probably guess, is the text that we want to display on the screen. And then finally, the fifth is the size of the font. And then, so this 16 here uh, should correlate to the, the font size that we had entered in the BM font interface. So again, if we go to options, font settings, um, actually this is eight and we're using 16. Let me, let's come back to that. Let's see what happens. All right. Oh, another important note is that if you, um, within phaser, um, anytime you uh, start a scene, It'll first run the preload method, and then once the preload method is done, it'll then go ahead and run the create method. Now, phaser is pretty neat, and so in this case, when we perform this load of a bitmap font, it's going to wait for this font to get downloaded, and then perhaps um, you know moved around in memory, or like you know parse the contents of that PNG file and put it into the GPU and stuff. Um, same as if you're loading. Uh, audio files, it's going to download the audio files and decompress them, or if you're loading sprites, it's going to download all those sprites. And then once all the, the loading is complete, uh, the preload function will finish, uh, and then the uh, create function will kick off. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and write this, and then um, we're going to go ahead and run the code. So one thing that I'm doing... Um, Oh, sorry. So this is this is what would happen if you loaded the the file earlier when we had the invalid font names, and so so all the content here is incorrect. So one thing to notice is that the URL here this is actually localhost 5000. And so what I've done is I did um, uh, previously I ran npm install serve s e r v e, and then so what that do, will do is it'll give you a little application that makes it easy to uh, run static content from your local file system. The problem is you can't simply double-click the index HTML file and then have the have the content appear in your browser because we need to download the the XML file and the PNG and we need to do that using you know AJAX and we get all sorts of security issues um, from modern browsers. Uh, and so what we do is we use a tool like SERVE. I recommend you check it out. Just do a Google search for uh, npm SERVE. And uh, what it does is it, it makes it really easy to run a simple static uh, uh, server, which will host your game. Uh, cool. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter, and hopefully we'll see a font. Cool. Awesome. So what I'm doing is I'm putting my face really close to the screen, and I'm seeing that the fonts, they're about, it looks like the font size is doubled. And so I think we have a discrepancy between that 16 and that 8 that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to go back to my code. I'm going to go down here to the 16. I'm going to change it to be an 8. I'm going to go back to the website and load it. Perfect. Cool. So if you look close at the screen, I'm um, going to squint really, really close. You can see that the font is um, actually pixel perfect. 
And so this is neat because we can actually use this to uh, you know, double the size of fonts. Um, so what I like to do is use this for um, you know, like headings and sub, sub, subheadings. Uh, so this, for example, being 16, this could be like a title. Darkness. It's, uh, it's going to be a very ominous game. So I'm just going to paste this up here because visually it comes earlier. So we have the x coordinate of 20, the y of 10. And then so down here, I'm going to change this coordinate to be about maybe 25, 24. So I'm going to save this. And so we see that our, our title will be here with a size 16 font. Then uh, the, the content within the game will be um, just uh, the size 8 font. So if I refresh, oh, so we see it's a little bit close, but here you can see the, uh, the double scaling is working pretty good. And we have the single size font as well. Um, move it down a little bit. Now, some bad things can happen though with these bitmap fonts. So, for example, if we were to change this to like a uh, 64, if I change this font to be like super, super huge, and if we look close enough at the pixels, okay, well, you can't really see on this display. Actually, it looks looks perfect on this display. Um, so if you were to actually load this on a mobile device, for example, I load, I do most of my development on an Android phone. Um, as you stretch the fonts, you can see like the left side of the fonts or the right side of the fonts. Every few rows will get like randomly adjusted by a single pixel. And so it can look kind of funny. And so if you are doing really large title fonts, um, and if those titles don't change, you know, you might want to consider using an image for those instead. Um, cool. And then you can see in this view that I'm using here, this is actually how I do 99% of the development for the crossover game and my other mobile games, is that um, I open up the web developer toolbar. Actually, let me, let me close all this and just do a refresh. So this is what the page looks like uh, with a normal desktop browser. And I'm gonna hit Command Shift I, or if you're on a Mac, I believe it's Command Option I. And what that does is it opens up uh, this view here. And so this tool here um, allows you to um, this is the, the web inspector, the web debugger. So this, this gives you a bunch of different tools for viewing and modifying um, uh, application information. And so for example, I'm able to interact with the game object. Um, but it, then if you go up here and you click toggle device toolbar, uh, this will create sort of this mobile web view. Anytime you enable and disable this, you will want to refresh the page um, just so that everything is uh, re-rendered properly. So this tool is really, really useful for, for mocking mobile devices. So for example, I can go down to like iPhone 7. Um, it'll attempt to use a similar resolution as the device. Uh, it'll set the user agent. Uh, it'll do a whole bunch of useful things. Um, it changes the way the input works as well. So instead of clicking on the screen and that fire a click event, it'll instead fire the uh, touch events. And so clicking and dragging will scroll, scroll the screen as well. So this is a very, very, very useful tool uh, for doing mobile development. Uh, cool. So yeah, I guess that's a wrap. That is how we um, were able to take a true type font, a TTF font, um, in particular a bitmap font, as we discovered on the DA font website. Uh, we found, in this case, press start 2p. Um, in theory, we read the license and determined whether or not it's, it's uh, something we can legally use. Uh, once we did that, um, we also went to this BM font uh, website. So just do a search for BM font and you'll come to this angel code site. And then you install BM font and then load the font uh, that we've downloaded. And then you have to modify it. So you have to change the font settings uh, and you also have to change the uh, export options. So once you've done that, you can save the files to disk and then you want to rename them slightly. Um, you want the font file to end in XML. You want to edit the XML file. You want to uh, invert the size setting. Um, so instead of being negative, you want it to be positive. And if you rename the PNG, you want to rename the, the file in here too. Finally, once you do that, um, you go ahead and you uh, load the font um, within your actual game code. And cool, that's that. Uh, so hopefully this has helped you uh, use these uh, semi-complex tools to load a bitmap font. Certainly I know it'll help me in the future as well. Uh, and again, if you like this content, please check out this Patreon. I'm going to post this video uh, later tonight, and it will be available on here um, perhaps a few weeks or maybe even a month um, before it goes public. 
Awesome. Thank you.